Committees and be back in action in January. Um, so it's my pleasure um, this morning to introduce Mary Burnett, who uh, is a longtime colleague and friend from right down Route 89 at Dartmouth. So she's an associate professor of psychiatry in the Geisel School of Medicine there, and um, also medical director of the Bureau of Mental Health Services within the New Hampshire Department of Health and Human Services. So she wears several hats, as we were just talking about in a meeting before coming over here. Um, and uh, I was looking uh, at her educational history and she went to uh, Lewis and Clark um, undergraduate in Portland, Maine. And believe it or not, that Oregon. Or, or Portland, Oregon. And that is the second, you are the second person this month who I've introduced who went to that same undergrad. And each time I think of this bucolic college. And so to this morning I even, I even went on the website to look it up and it is that, <laughs> as far as I could tell, on the rolling hills of yeah. Oregon. So anyhow, it sounds like a beautiful place. And then she stayed on and went to medical school at the Oregon Health Sciences uh, School of Medicine where um, they, they just do tremendous research, but I would guess you weren't having much time to do research while you were in medical school, but a great institution. Then did her residency at Dartmouth um, and stayed on there until now. And the way I first came to know uh, Mary's work is through a fellow named Bob Drake, who um, was, and they, they were a team <coughs> working with serious mental illness. And it was a time when we were doing uh, research on cocaine dependence, and we both had a similar kind of comprehensive community-oriented approach, and, um, and those approaches work very well. <laughs> so we aren't doing so much in that direction these days, but Mary and her colleagues continue to do it. Um, so, uh, you know, I just, I've always thought the world of, of the work that they do um, there and I, I look now, it's all been almost 20 years how time flies that you've been there <laughs> doing this work and has been mentoring people, more than uh, 50 uh, different types of students, undergraduate, graduate students, med students, residents, um, is uh, many different uh, grants, current very prolific grant writer, and is as excellent at getting grants that um, are rigorous scientifically, but also very oriented in moving work into the community. And that's something I feel like I could learn from and maybe our entire center, um, although we have Rick Ross and others who are also good at that. So, I, but I think um, the work that Mary's doing is um, very germane to things that we're trying to make happen. And um, I'm hoping that this visit could foster some collaborations that Mary and I always talk about having happened, but maybe now that we've had you captured here for <laughs> almost a day and a half, we will, we will uh, be able to see some of that through. So I'm thrilled to uh, have Mary here, and I would hope you can join me in giving her a warm welcome. Thank you for that nice introduction. Can people hear me okay? Okay. Is everybody here a researcher? Is this a, who's not a researcher? All right, okay, so I'm talking to researchers. I just like to know who I'm talking to. So I talk to a lot of clinicians. I do a lot of clinician um, training and so on, too. So, so I'm going to talk some about the work I've done on developing technology tools to tackle the problem of smoking in disadvantaged populations. And I'm going to talk a lot about the work I've done with people with mental illness today. I um, just want to acknowledge my funders. Uh, the column on the left are the grants that, that I've gotten, and the column on the right are grants of colleagues and collaborators where I've um, been co-investigator. And, and uh, the, high, the, the dark ones are work that contributed to what I'll talk about today. So who, how many of you here do smoking research? So the lot, you all know a lot about smoking. Um, so I don't, I'm, a lot of this you'll already know. But I want to set the context for disadvantaged populations um, and their smoking. Smoking is more common in disadvantaged people. We define that as people with low education or low income. Um, and in those groups, smoking is more common and quitting is less common. So look at this recent national survey data from the Drug Use and Health Survey. This pairing, this is people with less than high school 
This is college educated. The gray bars are smoking. The orange bars, if you were ever a smoker, what's the chance you quit? So you can see in folks with less than high school education, smoking is 20% currently. Chance of having been a lifetime smoker and quit was 30%. Whereas if you're a college grant, current smoking is only 5%, and lifetime smoking and quitting was 70%. Um, you see the same kind of pattern in, in unemployed compared to full-time employed people, and the same pattern but a higher prevalence of smoking in people living in poverty compared to people 200% the poverty level. So, so people who are disadvantaged, more likely to start, less likely to quit. You see that also in people with mental illness. This is from the same survey where they asked people whether they had a mental illness and they also um, figured out whether people had a severe mental illness like schizophrenia or bipolar disorder and people were also currently um, distressed with their mental illness. And, and these pairs show rates of smoking currently and ever having quit. This is without mental illness this is with a mental illness that's not severe, and this is with a severe mental illness. So you can see, it's just really interesting, the rates of smoking go up based on severity of mental illness, and the chance of quitting goes down in a, this really nice linear fashion. So you know, in disadvantaged populations also, you need to know a lot of people have mental illnesses. So if you're thinking about dealing with smoking in disadvantaged populations, you're dealing with people with mental illness and people with severe mental illness. And this shows from the same survey that this relationship between mental illness and smoking is sustained in all the risk groups, you know, those with less than a high school education, unemployment, poverty, and young people, because they're more likely to smoke. So you just see that same relationship with, with smoking and um, mental illness across all the risk factors. So if you have a mental illness, you're worse off. So why did I get interested in this? I want to tell you the story of Ted. Um, this is not actually a picture of Ted, but Ted looked a lot like this. Ted is a, uh, if you turn the clock back 20 years, I worked at a community mental health center, and I had a patient panel of about 500 people, inclu including Ted. Ted, at the time I worked with him, was about 38. He had schizophrenia. He had had a really tough time. He became ill when he was in college, dropped out, got into cocaine, terribly psychotic, in and out of the hospital, just terrible trouble for about 10 years. He finally got into community mental health treatment, got assertive community treatment, um, and was able to get his schizophrenia under control, was able to give up cocaine. So by the time I was working with him, he had a very part-time job. He had a girlfriend who he saw a lot. You can see in the picture. He had dinner with his mom on Sundays. He was doing pretty well. He had his illnesses well under control. But he smoked four packs a day, um, which at that time, 20 years ago, was not uncommon. Mental illness is associated with more heavy smoking. And um, he had type 2 diabetes. Um, so I did what was best practices for doctors at the time. I asked him if he smoked. He said yes. I asked him if he was willing to quit. He said no. And I advised him to quit. He said no thanks. And I let it go. And um, so I worked with him for about five years. He continued to smoke. Every year I'd ask him about quitting and he'd say no. Um, and I did that with my whole patient caseload. And mostly nobody wanted to quit and I didn't push it. And I thought I was doing a good job. We all thought I was going, we all thought we were doing a good job because we were keeping his mental illness stable and we were keeping him off cocaine. So I, I worked with him for about five years. I moved on to another job and then I took the job working at the state where I'm the medical director. One of the jobs I have is I have to review every death that happens in people enrolled in our mental health system. And so about six months into my job, I get a death report and who is it? It's Ted, dead at the age of 49. Um, what had happened? Well, he didn't show up for his case management appointment, didn't answer the phone. Mom calls case manager, haven't heard from Ted, what's going on? Hadn't heard from him either, so they call the police, the police go to do a wellness check, and they break the door down and he's dead on the floor. Died of a heart attack. 
at age 50, 49. So <clears throat> I felt bad about that. This, you know, I liked Ted a lot and it felt terrible. Life goes on. More death reports. That year, probably two dozen of the people who I had treated, who I had not helped quit, were dead, young, from cardiac disease, pulmonary disease, a little bit of cancer. You know, it just, I felt like this is not right. This is just not okay. Um, so these folks are dying young. And in around that year, this report actually came out showing, this is a study from the state of uh, Massachusetts showing that Medicaid recipients with severe, severe mental illness were more likely to die young than Medicaid recipients without mental illness. And over the next five to 10 years, more and more reports came out where it became clear there's this early mortality and it started to develop that it, the, the, the reason is these people smoke. There's some other reasons too, but the main driver of this early morbidity mortality is smoke. I like to show, you, all, you guys all know this, but I like to show this cartoon just showing the toxins in smoke that are harmful to health, um, including this tailpipe from which carbon monoxide from your car comes out and causes um, not just uh, lung disease and cancers, which everybody's aware of, but also diabetes and heart disease, which are really common causes of early morbidity and mortality. So... But the good news is, as you all know, you can help people quit, and quitting at any age improves health, reduces morbidity, and starts to correct the early mortality that happens from smoking. So I'd like to show this data from the British doctor study. How many people are familiar with British doctor studies? So some of you are. I just think this is so interesting. I wonder if I have a pointer here. Pointer? Hmm, yeah, okay. So this is for if people quit young, around age 30. The red line is the smokers who quit. The dotted line is the never smokers. Look at that, it com completely corrects the early mortality, whereas the cigarette smokers are dying younger. This is quitting around age 60. So like these all these cardiac rehab patients after the heart attack, if they quit, the, this is, uh, all right, which one is which? No, I don't, I'm not sure which. I think that this is, yeah, this is the stop smoking line. It's, it's better than the people who didn't stop smoking. So the message from this study, and there have been other studies um, similar to this since then, is that quitting improves health and, and starts to correct this, this um, early mortality. So it's never too late. You know, it's never too late to quit and to get benefits from quitting. So when we think about quitting, I like to think about, all right, where are all the levers that can be pressed? Um, there's, the, um, there's the environment and policies related to smoking that are really important. There's the person themselves. What are their characteristics, risk factors, and potential um, ways that you can help them quit and w what's going to drive them. There's the treatments. How effective is the treatment? Can we improve treatments? And then there's the clinicians who are going to link people to treatments, deliver treatments. Today I'm going to talk mostly about the patient and the treatment, but I think all of these are important and I have work in all of these areas, but today with the technology tools, we're really, we're targeting the patient and we're delivering treatment with the tools. So we'll talk about those. Okay, so in thinking about vulnerable populations, and in particular people with serious mental illness, what are their characteristics and what are we, you know, what are we up against or working with? People with serious mental illness tend to, they fit into disadvantaged groups. They tend to have low education and very low income. Mental illness often happens in adolescence or early adulthood. It interferes with people's educational trajectory, and then it interferes with ability to work so that people um, often are not as well educated and they're poorer. And in the groups that I work with, they're very poor. They're disabled from their mental illness. In one of our recent studies, the average income was $1,100 a month, basically their disability payment. These are really poor people. So they have less opportunity for the rewards that life can offer. Their smoking characteristics are they tend to be heavier smokers. Um, they 
depending upon age. Young people are lighter smokers these days compared to older smokers because taxation has gone up and people can't afford cigarettes the way they could afford them 20 years ago. Um, they tend to use multiple products. There's price sensitivity. People start with their Camel brand and then they switch over to cheap cigarillos or roll your own. Um, so there's, they also like menthol and flavors. Um, and there's e-cigarette use in the same way that you see in the general population or maybe more. Because this group tends to congregate together, there tend to be social networks where there's a lot of smokers and less quitters. We know that social context powerfully influences smoking and quitting. Um, these folks know smoking is bad for them. You ask them, is smoking bad for you? They say, yes, yes, it causes lung cancer. Everybody knows that. But they're less aware of some of the more subtle harms. Um, and there's misperceptions that smoking is also quite beneficial. Everybody thinks smoking is needed to manage stress, and it's needed to cope with my life situation and my mental illness. Um, if you ask people how many times they've quit, people quit a lot. There's, there's really no difference in quit attempts in people with mental illness and without. Um, but when this population tries to quit without treatment, they generally don't succeed. They, they really need to use cessation treatment to have success with quitting. But they have misperceptions about the safety and efficacy of treatment. Um, they, a lot of people think that nicotine is harmful, so why would you use nicotine replacement therapy, for example? This group also may have some bio biologic vulnerabilities. The vulnerability for mental illness may overlap in some ways with vulnerability for addiction, um, which may be one reason why they're more likely to start smoking and have a harder time quitting. Um, their reward anticipation is impaired in, in depression and schizophrenia. So think about if you're going to quit smoking, you need to be able to anticipate other uh, rewarding things. So you, you, you want to have pleasure. You need to be able to look forward to it. So you're saying no to your cigarette. You're going to say yes to, I don't know, an ice cream sundae or a beautiful walk in the park or playing with your daughter or something. If your ability to do that is impaired, it's harder to say no to that cigarette. This group also has symptoms, mood symptoms, psychosis symptoms, and cognitive impairments. It's harder to concentrate, pay attention, use executive functioning, plan for the future, and those characteristics may get in the way with being able to benefit from a standard cessation treatment. So we would need to think about those as we're planning what, what could work. And they're uninformed about treatment safety. I think I already said that. Nevertheless, combined pharmacological and behavioral treatments do work, but this group doesn't access them very much. So let's um, think about what kinds of treatments we use. Are people familiar with stages of change in addiction treatment? OK. So when people are in contemplation or, or where they're thinking about making a change, but they're not sure they want to change, What's effective is delivering motivational interventions. Um, In-person motivational interviewing, single session, has been tested in people with serious mental illness. Uh, Mike, Mark Steinberg has done a couple of really nice studies showing that it works. It works a lot better than just doing nothing or giving brief education. You can get about a third of people to move forward and show up for a treatment, cessation treatment, and get started with a quit attempt. So what cessation treatment should they show up for? What, what is effective? Um, combination of pharmacotherapy with a group or individual behavioral intervention is what works best for anybody, but in particular for this population, that's important. So the pharmacologic treatment reduces withdrawal, and the behavioral treatment teaches people the skills they need to control the urge to smoke when they get the urge and to not smoke when they have that urge. So, so, you know, treatment works pretty well. Um, this is a study from Eden Evans' group where they took bupropion. They added it to dual NRT, patch plus PRN gum or lozenge, and a intensive CBT, the freedom from smoking that's developed by the American Lung Association. They took that intervention. They adapted it somewhat for people who have cognitive impairments and symptoms. So they made it simpler, more repetitive, more supportive and concrete. And they delivered it in a group format. So when you do the combination of those three, um, at 12 weeks at the end of your treatment, you can get over a third abstinent, biologically verified. 
The comparison group was people who went to the group and used combination patch plus gum and placebo. So NRT with the group, you got 20% quit. This is not bad. But when treatment stops, you see people relapse. So by uh, six months, you know, over, over half of people have relapsed. But that's, you know, we were just looking at Steve's data this morning. That's what you see when treatment ends um, after three months of treatment for almost any kind of treatment or, or population. Chantix or varenicline is more effective, or it's thought to probably be more effective than any of the other pharmacologic approaches. And it's been studied in people with schizophrenia. Here's a study from Eden Evans where she did an open trial of that group, that freedom from smoking group, and Chantix, in order to get people set up for a relapse prevention trial. And over 12 weeks, she got 40% of people to quit, which is pretty close to what you see in general population studies with Chantix. This is data from Jill Williams' um, paper of the drug company. So Chantix company studied this medication in people with schizophrenia. And in that study, they used an individual supportive counseling, very brief, like five minutes check-in. So they didn't have that freedom from smoking um, group. And Chantix still worked much better than placebo, but at 12 weeks you can see, what was it, 19% abstinent compared to Eden Evans, 40%. So although it's not a direct comparison, one of my interpretations of these two studies is that the behavioral intervention really makes a difference. The more intensive CBT probably adds quite a bit to your pharmacotherapy in this population and probably in, in most populations. So those were medication trials, intensive, you pay people to come every week. What happens when you do treatment in the community? So I'm, I'm really interested in real world, how do you translate getting uh, your treatment out into the community, and how does it work when you get it in the community? So these are data from a study that we did with a CMS grant to our state where we um, implemented community-based treatment in 10 community mental health centers in New Hampshire. And in this study, we um, asked everybody to meet with their psychiatrist and talk about pharmacotherapy and select a pharmacotherapy for them. And then we randomly assign people to also get either no other behavioral intervention or referral to the quit line. It's typical quit line, you know, three sessions over the phone. Or to get that freedom from smoking 12-week tailored intervention delivered individually over the phone because we wanted to have a scalable approach to that more intensive treatment. Um, and people were randomly assigned to either get cash incentives for abstinence or not. So we ended up with six groups. In the, th in the three treatment groups, we found no differences in the community delivery of treatment. In terms of the pharmacotherapy, one of the reasons there may not have been a difference was when people talked with their doctors about what would work for them and what they were willing to do, 60% of people chose NRT. Even though Chantix is the most effective approach, only 16% chose Chantix. Um, even though I went and I trained personally, every prescriber in the 10 mental health centers every year during the study, so they knew Chantix could be used safely and effectively. They knew about those two previous studies. People didn't choose it. They chose NRT. So our quit rates were um, you know, around 14%. And this is the difference between the incentive group and the non-incentive group. Incentives worked. Incentives added benefit to that community treatment. No surprise to you guys. You, you know all about that. But we showed that you can implement incentives in community clinics. Um, it, it, people used it, and they benefited from it. Um, and so this, if, you, if you're, you know, you're thinking about as a smoking cessation treatment researcher, you're like, why is that? Why don't you see as much relapse in that group? Because in this study, real world, people could start their intervention whenever they wanted. We tried to get everybody to start in the first quarter, but some people lagged and chose to start their incentives here. <laughs> so we, that's why we have a little uptick at the end. If, when we align our data, um, so that we look at people's assessments after they started their incentive program, this is what you see, which is what you would expect. You see a relapse curve, you know, about half of people relapse over that first six months, which is what you would expect. So, so that's community treatment. 
doesn't work as well, but it definitely works, and incentives are beneficial. So I like to think about, um, well, how are we going to scale up behavioral treatments? How are we going to get treatment out to more people? If you, you know, if I call up the mental health centers in New Hampshire right now and say, I have a patient, I'd like them to get tobacco treatment, um, can you deliver motivational interviewing? No. Do you have that freedom from smoking CBT group going on right now so I could enroll my patient? No. Um, so we have a Center for Technology of, and Behavioral Health, and so I'm thinking about, all right, let's see if we can harness te technology. Um, I, I, I love Minnesota. They, they do a lot of neat work with their tobacco treatment in Minnesota, and they publish about it, which is great. This is showing data from the tobacco quit line where they implemented a website along with their telephone service. And um, it's showing the reach, the efficacy, and the cost of a telephone quit line, which also has good reach, but you have to have a human being available, so it's a lot harder to deliver broadly than a website, which is always there and available. The reach of the website is just, you know, 10 to 20 times higher. It's, no, it's a no-brainer. Their, their self-reported abstinence is the same with the telephone quit line and people who enrolled in the website. And the cost per quit, no surprise, is like 10 times less for the website. So to me, it just makes a lot of sense to be thinking about using technology to deliver tobacco treatment. People worry, though, about um, disadvantaged populations. Do they have technology? There was a lot of concern about the digital divide, um, especially 10 years ago. But I, I think the divide is closing. And so we. We surveyed people with serious mental illness in our clinics to try to understand, well, maybe our people don't have techno <coughs> technology. Uh, grant reviewers always think your people don't have technology. So we did the survey to try to answer that question. Do they really have technology? We surveyed 404 people, three states, four clinics. And this is what we found. The blue bar is the Pew National Survey data, the yellow bar is the Pew survey data among people with low income, and the green bar are, are patients with SMI. And you can see smartphone use identical in people with SMI and other low income people. Um, computer use a little bit less. What we found, we also asked, did you use, this is computer at home, we also asked, did you use a computer at your friend's or family's house or at the library? And a, a third of people said yes, they used computer other places. So about 60 people had recently used the internet on the computer. This really surprised me, Facebook use. Everybody's using Facebook the same amount, oh my goodness. Over two thirds. So social media, they're using, they're getting on social media when they're getting on the internet. And then we asked people, would you be willing to get an intervention for health or for mental illness over your phone or computer? And over two thirds said yes. I'd be interested. So we feel like this is very feasible in people, disadvantaged people with, with mental illness. There is an age difference, as you would expect. Young people are using a lot more technology than older people. Here, the, um, this is the 20-somethings. This is the 30 and 40-somethings. Um, once you get up to the 50-somethings, there's not as much use. But look at the willingness. 50-somethings are just as willing to use technology for treatment as the 20-somethings are. Um, so it seems like we've got a lot of feasibility for using technology for this group of smokers. When we first started this work, we thought, well, you know, maybe we should just use what's already out there. There's a lot of smoking cessation websites. Um, so one day, Joel Farron and I got online, and we typed in smoking cessation, and we looked at the four the, what websites came up on the page. And it was a nice array of websites, um, Become an X, the, and then a, a National Cancer Institute website, um, another private nonprofit kind of um, foundation website, and the Philip Morris website for smoking cessation as part of the tobacco settlement agreement. They're supposed to get people to quit. What a joke, right? So we tested those four websites. We had an um, expert panel us evaluate their content. Do they include evidence-based content? And then we had people with serious mental illness show up, sit down with the website, and try to use it. We gave them two tasks. And what we found was the NCI website was the best in content. Um, but when we sat people down in front of the computer to use these four websites, they, most people couldn't. 
and the including the NSI website. And the website that was best, most usable was the Philip Morris website. But the Philip Morris website contained some misinformation. So we felt we needed to develop our own that would be more usable and contain evidence-based content. We've done the same thing with apps. There's also a lot of smoking cessation apps out there. Joelle Farron took the lead on that, and she downloaded the 1,000 apps that were available like in 2013 or something, and then she randomly selected 100 and tested them for usability and content. And again, the NCI app contained the best content. It also had usability problems. Since that time, um, smokefree.gov has two new apps, and we're just now in the process of evaluating them. So I don't, I don't know how, how they rate. So, so we decided we were going to develop our own, and we wanted to start with that first step of motivational interviewing. Can we have a web-based intervention that can motivate people to move on to a quit attempt with cessation treatment? Um, we um, linked up with a colleague named Armando Rotundi. He had done a lot of work on website development for people with cognitive impairments. He started out with people with brain injury, and then he moved to people with schizophrenia. And he, he's an engineer, and he just systematically went through all of the different ways you can set up a um, website and tested them all and developed, found what, what works best when you have cognitive impairments. We, so we took what we learned from him and we sat down and did a lot of user testing with our own patients. And this is what we found works when you are working with disadvantaged populations with impairments. This is how you have to design them. To begin with, on the landing page, you have instructions. So it just concretely tells people how to use it. And we gave instructions for how to use a computer mouse if people don't know how to use a mouse. We use a simple linear design where you start in one place and you're supposed to just go through. It's, it's not all segmented out. It's very linear. Um, and we provide information in one chunk on a page. And then you move from page to page. And the reason we do that is if you have a website where you have information content that requires scrolling, think about what your brain does when you are reading a website and scrolling. You have to focus on a part of the page read it, know that you're at the bottom, you need to scroll, move your hand, move your finger, watch the screen, know when to stop, start reading again, read to the bottom, know when to no, stop, scroll, know when to stop. It's, it's complicated cognitively. Um, so we don't do that. We go page to page. So you, your brain doesn't have to decide where to stop. You just see everything on the page, you read it all, and then you click to get to the next section. Very cognitively easy. Um, we use simplified language, fifth grade level. Um, it's amazingly hard to do this. I don't know if you've tried. If you really want disadvantaged populations to understand what you're trying to convey, you have to do this. And you will find that it, there's creep where you do it and then you'll creep back up. You, so you, you really have to work hard for that. We also use large buttons and large font. Disadvantaged people have vision problems. They might have had glasses, but they've lost them, and they can't afford to get another pair. Or they never did get them. They can't see, so you need to make it big. And you need all your buttons to be big so they can, if they have dexterity problems, they can get that little arrow onto, onto the, um, the button. Only two layers deep. In our tools, there's a lot of information. And if you want to know more, you can click and get more information. And then when you're done with that, you click again, and you're back at the, the surface level. The reason we do this is to make sure people can sort of titrate their level of information, but they can't get lost. And we have no links to external sites or content. When you do this and you watch people use this tool where you think you're going to have this great invention and you're going to, oh, there's this other stuff that's really great. I'm going to let them link out to that. Before you know it, your study participant is off buying a car on some weird website. And they have completely forgotten that they're supposed to be learning about how to quit smoking. So, so you, you minimize that. You also minimize other distracting things. When you see a website, you think, oh, let's, let's do these flashy pictures. Let's do these moving things. It looks, so, it looks so sexy and great. What we found is people just get distracted and confused. They don't know what that stuff means. Um, if you use pictures, it should concretely demonstrate what your words are trying to convey. 
Um, also use concrete cues for how to use the website. If you have a little tiny weird thing that people are supposed to click on, it's supposed to do something, a lot of this population won't know what that means and they won't know what to do. We also used um, software that reads our text so that people have audio. Um, we have it set up so that it um, comes on when people start. We teach them that they can click this big red button to turn it off if they don't like it. People always, they have it on for a while and then they click and turn it off for a while and then they turn it back on. As they realize they can take in the information a lot better when they hear it. It only took me five years to realize, geez, I can take in information a lot better when I hear it and when I'm reviewing grants and I have to read 800 pages, maybe I should turn the audio on. Your computer can do that too. And it really improves comprehension. We have video hosts who, have, who say they have a mental illness and they quit smoking. We do that for engagement and to create social norms for quitting using cessation treatment. Video streaming takes a lot of data. If you're working in clinics that serve disadvantaged peoples, they don't have data. They can't stream a lot of stuff. Even though people love video and they probably prefer to have their whole intervention be via video, if you're streaming it, it's not feasible. Also, if people are doing it at home, they're not going to have the bandwidth to stream a lot of video. So you have to, when you're developing these tools, you have to think about where are people getting this and what is feasible. Video may or may not be feasible. Um, we also have video quit stories. We think the quit stories are really important. They, they are engaging. They create social norms for quitting with cessation treatment, and they demonstrate concretely how you quit. How do you put on the nicotine patch? How do you literally take that Chantix pill and put it in your mouth? How do you delay smoking? And we also have videos of doctors talking about treatment. We did this, we did a lot of focus groups in our development, and we heard from people. Some people really want to hear about quitting from friends and family. Other people really want to hear about it from doctors, so we give them a choice. They can hear about it both ways. Okay. So. This is a page from our, one a page from our tool. Looks really boring. It's that way on purpose. This is easy to comprehend and learn from. This is the Freedom From Smoking website. This is what you're, this is the same content as what we have right here. But how do you know what you're supposed to read? What are all these cool red boxes? I think I should click on one of those. Oops, I end up somewhere else. Oops, I'm buying that car. And what is this lady smiling about? Why is there a blue sky? I don't really understand what that means. What does that have to do with quitting smoking? It's just confusing for people. And it's hard, hard, much harder to learn from. So you can see we've designed our tool so that it, it's, it's very easy to engage with and learn from. We base our interventions on the theory plan behavior. When we developed our first tool, single session, we tested it in an um, inner city clinic in Chicago with seriously mentally ill folks. When people got the tool, 42% of them went on to actually show up for cessation treatment and start, you know, they started a group or they started the medication compared to 15% who we gave a, just a pamphlet. Um, so that was promising. We've studied this in about five different studies now. Um, the, the most recently published one was an implementation trial where in that study where we enrolled 661 people as the it, to begin the process we gave them the our engagement tool 1500 people got it and 45 percent of them proceeded to start cessation treatment so weirdly this is 45 percent you know our first studies 45 percent so we're, we've gotten really consistent results um, and this is compared remember that individual motivational interviewing that mark steinberg tested they got about 33% to move on to treatment. So we think this technology approach is very comparable, maybe even better than in-person um, delivery of that. So our next steps for this is we have a grant in to get an SBIR to commercialize this. What we learned in doing all these studies, though, is I got people motivated, and then I had to train all these clinics to do the CBT because they didn't really have trained clinicians. And I got really sick of training clinicians to do CBT. So I decided we're going we're gonna to create a technology-delivered behavioral intervention that will do the whole thing. So we took that Freedom From Smoking group that I, all these other studies have used, and we t we, I computerized it. Um, and we um, used our easy-to-use platform that I've shown you. Um, this tool 
is it has 48 sessions that are designed to be used in about five minutes. It has education, interactive skills training, practice sessions. Um, there are characters whose quitting smoking story unfold throughout the program, so they demonstrate the skills that are being taught throughout the program. Um, there's knowledge checks at the end, so to try to consolidate knowledge. And at the end, we have fun facts and inspirational sayings that people love, so it's a kind of a reward for finishing the session. And at the end of each session, people give a star rating, so that if, if they don't like it, they click one star. If they love it, they click four stars, so it's a way for them to engage and weigh in on what they've learned and how, how the session went. And then there are email and text reminders. So if you don't engage with the program for three days, you'll get a reminder, come on in. So this is the content. We've done two pilot studies with this um, CBT uh, delivered through technology. Um, briefly, uh, let me point to this. 23 sessions of the 48 were accessed on average, 250 minutes spent with the intervention. 87% of the modules were rated on that star rating of three or four. Um, the, the modules that didn't get rated highly were the sessions that contained repetitive information. We purposefully repeated important content. We taught breathing to manage stress, and the, um, we taught, we overtaught using nicotine replacement therapy. People liked it, hearing it one or two times. When you get to the third or fourth time, they started not liking it. Efficacy, 25% cut down, 10% had biologically verified abstinence at two months. We felt like that's promising for, you know, this was just a trial with this. There was no human being attached to it. There's no, um, we didn't provide pharmacotherapy um, for the eight weeks. So, so we felt like it was promising. Utilization, I just, I'm going to wrap up in the last three minutes here talking about utilization of tech tools. This is um, of importance when you're thinking about using technology to intervene. You want to make sure people use it, right? If they don't use it, it doesn't work. So this is our use data. Um, the gold bars are days accessed, and the gray bars are the number of sessions accessed. When I first saw this, I was really disappointed. I thought, oh, there's so much variability. We have, you know, about a quarter were low utilizers, about a quarter were high utilizers, and then there's people in the middle. Um, but as I thought about this and I was writing up the paper, I hearkened back to a previous study where we were referring to that people to that in-person in group, the Freedom from Smoking group. This is the use data. Real World Clinic, in-person cessation group, it looks almost identical. Like you have a lot of low utilizers who only showed up once. You have some high utilizers and then a bunch of people in the middle. So our tool, we felt like it was engaging enough that people utilized it in a way similar to in-person treatment. And compared to other studies of website utilization, I just showed two examples here. An early example of a quit line that incorporated a website when they this quit line, the, the mean utilization for the quit line was two calls and only one login to the website. So, you know, not great utilization. This is a new study that just came out this fall of Jonathan Bricker, University of Washington. He developed an acceptance and commitment therapy delivered by a website. Pretty cool. He randomly compared um, people who, to, to get that website or smokefree.gov, the NCI website. And he found over one year an average of seven logins to the website, um, and no difference between groups. So our our website, our mean is 11. So I think I think we're we're doing okay here. Um, and with this, you know, this is interesting. There's no difference between groups between the acceptance and commitment therapy and the smokefree.gov. 27% quit. So in conclusion. We've got a scalable behavioral intervention platform. It's easy to use. You can see what needs to be done to make these technology tools usable by disadvantaged populations. We think we've got comparable engagement and participation. And this could be a tool that could be used in combination with other things we know work, like incentives and pharmacotherapy. Um, and that's our intent, is to try to, to study it in that way. All right, so I'm out of time here. I just want to thank all the collaborators. It takes a village to do clinical research. As you all know, you're part of a village. Um, and we have time for some questions. Well, 
Well, right now, we've been working with a model of clinicians linking people to these tools. In really disadvantaged populations, I mean, you, there's a couple approaches. One is to advertise, quit lines advertise. Um, you can advertise in the old-fashioned ways, or you can be advertising online, which where you reach a lot more people, and that's basically what we would do if we went that approach. But because I want people to use pharmacotherapy and the way to pharmacotherapy is through a clinician, our current model and way of thinking is that we're linking people through clinics. So clinicians suggest they try it, or we advertise in clinics, and then, and then we facilitate getting people to use it through a clinical interaction. I do. So I do. Of course I do. <laughs> That's my bias. I think so. I think it's hard for people to come in. There's advantages and disadvantages to every approach. The advantage of coming in is that we are social creatures, and we are strongly influenced by social interactions. And when people come in in person and have a counseling session, that's influential. And a group with peers, if someone quits and leads the way, that can really influence people's quit. There's a lot of data showing that um, having quitters in your social network will influence your quitting. So, so there's, there's, there's advantages. The disadvantages, you know, it's hard for people to come in. They don't want to come in. It's a pain. People are busy. Um, my bias, I think, although, and there's pretty good data that, that when you combine a technology-based approach with some clinical support, that it's more effective than the technology-based approach alone. So, you know, yeah, I think, I think we should talk. And, you know, there's, for that group, I don't know how many disadvantaged people there are in that group. So, you know, one option is use, you could use the ncismokefree.gov. They actually will create agreements with researchers to provide data so you can know who accesses it. Um, or if you have a lot of disadvantaged people, I don't know. That website has improved and improved over the years. It might be good enough. Or, or you know, we could talk about using something like ours where it's, it's tailored so that if you have a 60-year-old who doesn't know how to use a computer very well, they can use this. Yes. Yeah. 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 So they might benefit from a tailored intervention. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 That's great. great. Yes. Well, I think for young people especially, I think um, social influences are really important, as you know, and just showing um, quit stories, I think, is motivational for people. Um, when we, you know, you know, I did this young adult study with our motivational intervention, and 15% um, of the young people who we gave the single session motivational intervention, they just quit. Um, so. I think just taking the time to walk through the pros and cons, my own pros and cons of smoking, how much does it really cost, what are the, what are the downsides, and then walking through options of, for how to quit, that is motivational to people. Um, so I, I think that can help. And then people who are more addicted probably are going to need more treatment. Um, so. 
you know, and I know you're, you're working with somebody who's got a good app to, to do that. Well, we've done it as a technology-based tool, and it works great. Can you, without having a, a human being link them to the tool, is that what you're asking? Like online, like starting with that online, like advertising online and bringing them in online? I think so. I mean, I, it's, it's testable for sure. I would think it would be really helpful. The issue is getting the, you know, the advantage to us of offering it in the clinic, if people are there for an appointment, everybody went through the whole thing. Nobody left early. Whereas if you're doing it in the wild, how many people will leave early? I don't know. I mean, we could, we could do a pilot study and just try it and see. See how many people stick with it. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't know about that. Um, Yeah, so we're doing an e-cig trial right now in people with serious mental. So a lot of people with serious mental illness don't quit. You, you saw the data. And so, um, and we noticed that people sample e-cigarettes. And, and I believe the recent report that concluded that e-cigs probably are dramatically less harmful than cigarettes, combustible cigarettes. Probably, you know, dramatically, dramatically less harmful. So. So we're, we're studying, we're doing a randomized trial of um, e-cigarette sampling, basically. We're, uh, it's not a cessation trial. FDA doesn't let you do cessation trials. So we randomly assign people to either just be assessed for eight weeks or to be provided e-cigarettes and to try using them instead of smoking. And we see, you know, breath CO just goes way down and people are smoking way less. They're, they are substituting e-cigarettes for their cigarettes dramatically. Some people more than others, of course. Some people quit completely. Most people cut way down, but don't give up the last two or three or four cigarettes, probably that first one in the morning. Um, so we're also we're testing for um, urine carcinogens in that study, so we'll have data on whether carcinogen exposure is reduced. We're not doing the kinds of things that you would be interested in, like um, all of the um, vascular inflammatory kinds of markers, but you're pre you presume if people are smoking a lot less, they're exposed to less of that stuff. So e-cigarettes as a way of harm reduction is very interesting to me, and I think super promising, super so promising. Providing we're providing them, so and we are actually we're following them for six more months. And what we see is this is a really impoverished group, and they they go back to smoking. Um, but, but again, this isn't a cessation trial. We're not telling them anything. because we, we didn't feel we were allowed to tell them anything. So we weren't, we, 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 we gave them information about e-cigarettes and that we think they're safe, but we're not saying at the end, just use e-cigarettes, you know, continue with this. We're, we're not doing that. Smoking is cheaper than e-cigarettes? I think smoking is cheaper. I think it's their habit. They, they're still buying. I, I, the e-cigs vary in price, but the price point is similar. You know, we need to actually, we should look at exactly what is the price point difference. Um, it depends upon the device. It depends upon the state and how much taxation of cigarettes is happening. One of our big study sites is Kentucky, where cigarettes are super cheap. Um, so that may be part of it at, at that study site. The other site is Massachusetts, but we don't have as many people in Mass where they're more expensive. But I suspect they'll be okay. Soon, so uh, I think we should wrap up. Right. Thanks very much. Well, thanks for having me.